This is my very first 3D printer, the Creality CR10S, that I bought back in 2018. Now, I love it, but it's so outdated that I simply don't use it anymore. I mean, I still have to level the bed with a piece of paper and sneak G-code in for an SD card. And PLA is basically the only material that it can actually print reliably. But the thing that bugs me the most is that it prints at the exact same speed that hopes and dreams evaporates. So basically, this is a piece of garbage. Now, I could just throw this relic into the dustbin and upgrade to a more modern printer. But being my first printer, abandoning it feels a bit like portraying an old friend who just runs very slowly. So instead, I'm going to try and modernize it. Now, I could solve most of my problems by just replacing the tool head with something like this, installing clipper and be done with it. But no, if you've seen any of my other videos, you would know that. We don't do that here. And I mean, that's way too easy. If I'm gonna save this printer, I'm not just gonna slap on some upgrades, I'm giving it a whole new identity. Step one, bulk up the frame properly. I'm swapping in chunky 4040 extrusions so it can handle high speeds without wobbling around like a frightened flamingo. Every axis, the Z, Y and X is getting linear rails because I'm done tuning and cleaning these little wheels. Oh how I hate you. For the Z axis, no more rods. We're going full belt conversion. Powered by the original steppers running on 24 volts with the EZ2209 drivers. For the Y-axis, we're going full overkill. Dual MGN12 rails and kicking it into all-wheel drive with two LDO superpower steppers, each chugging 48 volts of pure motivation to the EZ5160 RGB drivers. And because all that force needs some serious traction, I'm throwing in 9mm gates belts. And to help those motors glide without breaking a sweat, I'm ditching the chunky aluminium gantry plates and swapping them for my custom designed carbon fiber ones. The X axis gets the same love. An LDO speedy power motor, 48 volts and another EZ5160 driver to power it. Now for the tool head. For maximum rigidity, I designed my own custom carriage that will be made out of carbon fiber plates and aluminium. It rides on a MGN9 rail and carries a water-cooled Fiatus High Flow Dragon hot end because I'm cooling this like a gaming PC. Feeding it is the LDO Orbiter 2.5 extruder and for parts cooling, well, I designed my very own cooling duct that I spent way too many hours doing flow analysis on and paired that with a universal turbo kit from BiQ. And for a couple of quality of life upgrades, I'm adding a mains power heater and because I'm beyond tired of wrestling prints of a glass bed, why won't you come off? I'm upgrading to a magnetic flexible build plate. Now for the electronics, we're replacing its brain, all of it, with a big tree tech Octopus Max easy board because subtlety is overrated. And joining the party is the EBB36 board and a Raspberry Pi 4 to run Clipper and finally bring this thing into the modern era. And since I'm done with bits of paper, I'm getting a cartographer 3D probe to handle leveling like a civilized machine. But we're still not done. Because I'm already water cooling the hot end, I figured why not water cool everything. So all the 48 volt stepper motors are getting these NEMA 17 water blocks from Melo. And to tame my OCD itch, I'm sleeving every wire and making a custom cable tray for the electronics cabinets, just like this one. And finally, the whole machine gets wrapped in a Perspix enclosure so I can print the good stuff. Now with all that out of the way, let's get to the fun parts. Okay wait, before I do anything stupid, let's first get a baseline. I'm going to print a Benchy with the printer exactly as it is right now, so we have something to compare to once we turn this thing into a completely new creature. Well, this might just be one massive joke. Now just a quick note, this CR10S is not completely stock anymore. The original board died a few years ago and I couldn't find a replacement. So I upgraded it with a Victory Tech E3 RRF mainboard and a Victory Tech TFT 35 E3 display. 
Well, I don't think it's gonna be too difficult to beat one hour and 38 minutes. At least the quality is quite good. Because this video is already five minutes long and I do still have a family and some kind of personal life, I'm breaking this build into several videos. In the rest of this one, I'll be focusing on the new tool head, the electronics and getting the printer to a point where it can actually print its own replacement parts in ABS. To build a new tool head, I'll need the following parts. An MGN9 rail with its MGN9 H block, a heater cartridge and a thermistor. The hot end assembly, the extruder, my custom design 3D printed parts printed out of ABS and a massive shout out to Valdu for letting me hijack his 3D printer in order to print these. For the electronics we need the cartographer probe and the EBB36 board. And lastly the aluminium and carbon fiber parts. Wait a minute. Well this is embarrassing. I have absolutely no way to make these parts. Luckily for me, PCBWay is the sponsor of today's video. Now PCBWay isn't just about PCBs, although they do that insanely well. They offer a wide variety of services like CNC machining, 3D printing, laser cutting and many many more. Which means they handled all of the precision parts for this tool head. Now for this build, the aluminium parts were SLM 3D printed and the carbon fiber plates were laser cut. As you can see, they turned out beautifully. If you want to check out their quality for yourself, you can use my link in the description below to get $5 off of your next order. And make sure you don't miss their massive Christmas deals with discounts up to 50% off. Thank you BCBWay for helping me bring this project to life. Alright, now it's time to prep all of the parts for assembly. First I'm installing the threaded heat set inserts into the 3D printed parts. Then I countersink the carbon fiber plates so all the screws sit perfectly flush. After that I drill a few aluminium holes to size and tapping threads where needed. And since I went with the flat pack version of the cartographer probe, I first had to solder and assemble it myself. All of the parts are now prepped and ready for assembly. Now the ideal scenario would be to assemble the tool head and then bolt it onto the printer. But that would mean that I need to disassemble the X gantry and I'm way too lazy to do that. So instead I'm going to assemble the tool head piece by piece directly onto the X gantry. Now the only downside for doing it that way is that I won't be able to get the total weight of the tool head and I really want to know what the total weight is going to be just to compare it to my CAD model. So instead I'm just going to stack all of the parts on top of each other and call that the total weight. So it looks like the carriage comes in at 73.2 grams. And that's not too bad. Now for the rest of the parts. And don't forget the beacon. And that comes in at 338 grams. Not too bad. Just about 5 grams lighter than the CAD model. I compared each part to the CAD weight and the only differences were in the 3D printed pieces. Now I designed the tool head so that the center of mass sits as close as possible to the center of the MGN9 block. And as you can see, it's pretty much right there. With that balance, plus the rigidity of the carriage, the input shaper results should be really good. Well, in theory. Well, I guess it's time to assemble everything. Seriously, you've 
got to be kidding me. I completely forgot about the belt. The spot where I wanted the belt to run is now occupied by the linear rail T-nuts. And I do not know how I missed that. So at the moment, there is no space for the belt. But I might be able to fix it. If I can design something to shift the motor and the tensioner a few millimeters down, it still might work. I designed two simple brackets and decided to make them out of 3mm aluminium sheet. I printed the templates on paper, glued them directly onto the aluminium and used a center punch to mark all of the hole locations. Then it was time to break out the jigsaw and cut these blades to shape. And finally drill all of the holes and just like that, problem solved. We are back in business. Now to finally finish the tool head. Now that is a proper tool head. The assembly of the tool head is finally done. And you might have noticed that I didn't install the cartographer probe. Just before I wanted to install it, I quickly measured the distance between the mounting surface and the nozzle. You must be kidding me. What went wrong? <sighs> and it worked out that the probe is going to sit just too close to the nozzle. And because I don't have a working printer to reprint the mount and the duct, I have to leave this for the next video. I might just do like a dedicated video for the installation of this. So if you want to see something like that, please let me know in the comments. Now for the next step is to replace its brain. Before I start ripping everything out and connecting wires like a raccoon in a server room, I decided to be responsible for once and make a mock-up tray for all of the electronics. I started by laying out all of the components to figure out where everything should live. And once I was happy with the layout, I built a base out of aluminium extrusions and added DIN rails so everything actually has a proper mounting solution. And luckily, past me made one good decision. I printed a ton of these DIN rail mounts ahead of time. And then it was time to wire everything up and hope I didn't make a mistake that would immediately release all of the magical smoke. I'm finally finished with all of the wiring, everything is hooked up except for the pump and the fans for the water cooling loop, that's going to be next, but before I dive into that I first want to check if everything gets power and most importantly that we don't lose any magical smoke. So here goes nothing. We've got power here and here, there as well and here. And most importantly, there's no smoke coming out. So next up, let's get the water cooling loop running. Now for the water cooling loop, we need a few components. First up is a radiator. This is a 240 mil aluminum radiator. And to cool the radiator, I'm gonna use two D30 120 mil Fantec fans. To circulate the coolant, I'm gonna use this little rig that I made to flush radiators. It's got a no-name pump on it. It should be enough. If it's not enough, I'm gonna exchange it with a beefier pump, like a D5, but it should work quite well. And to connect these together, I'm gonna to use standard flexible tubing um, that I use on PCs. And to connect the super thin four millimeter polyurethane tubing that's used on the water block for the nozzle, I'm gonna use these little adapters. They are four millimeter to standard water cooling fittings that's a three quarter inch fret. To seal off these because they don't have any o-rings, I'm gonna use PTFE tape. And to fill the entire loop, I'm gonna use these, this blue liquid Mayhem's water cooling, PC water cooling coolant. So yeah, let's get building. <laughs> A 
Everything is now hooked up and working. Now the next step is the thing I've been dreading the most and that's the firmware and getting the printer config file set up. After that, we should have a working printer. Five hours later. No more errors. Finally, no more errors. Oh, that took way too long. All right, so I spent a bit of time poking around at the settings, not optimizing or fine tuning, just enough to make the printer behave and produce a decent print. So the only fair thing to do is to print a new Benchy, same model, filaments and settings, just with a new tool head and a new brain. That's one hour, three minutes and 18 seconds. That's more than half an hour faster than the original Benchy. And the base part, I haven't even started with the speed upgrades. And the weird thing is that in some places, this Benchy actually looks better than the original one. But I'll let you decide. That's a half an hour saved and I still think that the after Benchy looks better than the before Benchy. And I mean, that's without any fine tuning or input shaper. Now that's a wrap for part one of this build series. In the next video, I'll be rebuilding the entire frame and giving this printer some serious speed upgrades. If you don't want to miss that, please make sure you subscribe. I'll also link all of the components used for this build as well as all of the files if you want to make this printer for yourself. Now like always, thank you for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. Now I just need to make a dodgy cardboard enclosure and let this thing print its own replacements.